Good afternoon, my name is Dan Attridge. For those of you who don't know me, I have the pleasure of serving as the Dean of the Law Schools. And it's my pleasure today to welcome everyone uh, to our lecture. Uh, today's lecture, just a word about it, is part of our St. John the 23rd lecture series, which began in our law school back in 1965. And for those of you who may be too young to remember, uh, John the 23rd served as Pope uh, from 1958 to 1963. And he was probably best known uh, for calling the Second Vatican Council. And if you don't know what that is, I urge you to read about it. <laughs> he was canonized as a, as a saint in 2014. Um, the lecture series invites uh, outstanding professionals like our speaker today who come to us from various fields of public life to share their perspectives on the topic of their choosing. And on the back page of your program, you will see a listing of our speakers who have graced the podium as part of this uh, series over the many years we've had. Our speaker today is Monsignor Peter J. Boggy, and in the interest of time, rather than detail uh, for you all of his impressive credentials, I'll simply refer you to the third page of your program for a description of his remarkable background and extensive experience. And there we will learn more about his career, uh, not only currently as a priest, but formally as a lawyer. And Monsignor Vaghi is currently serving as the pastor of the Church of the Little Flower in Bethesda, where his parishioners include uh, the Chief Justice of the United States. Uh, he's the ch a chaplain and also chief recruiter uh, for the John Carroll Society, which is a distinguished group uh, of men and women who sponsor, among other things, uh, the Red Mass. He's also a, an author, a uh, lecturer, and this is the first time I've said this in introducing someone, a podcaster. <laughs> uh, uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, given my current position here, Monsignor Boggy is a distinguished member of the Board of Trustees of the Catholic University of America, which among other things, sets the budget for the law school. <laughs> so, Monsignor Boggy will be speaking today on the topic of friendship with Jesus and each other. We're quite fortunate that he's willing to share his thoughts with us. Please join me in welcoming Monsignor Boggy. Dan, thank you very much, and President Garvey, thank you for taking time out of your busy day, and all the faculty, and all the students, and everybody else who decided to come to a cool room on probably the hottest day of the year. It's pretty hot out there if you've been out there at all today. But I'm very honored to be asked to, uh, to give this uh, reflection today, and I've entitled it, as the Dean mentioned, a friendship with Jesus and each other. At the outset, uh, uh, I would like to say a few words about uh, Pope John the Twenty-Third, after whom this lecture has been named. Pope John the Twenty-Third, known as the Good Pope John, was most identified by his wit and his piety, his lack of pretense, and his love of persons. Considered a pastoral pope. He reigned from 1958 to 1963. He was truly loved for his sincerity and his goodness and his real gentleness to others. From an early age in the seminary in Northern Italy at Bergamo, his love of others came from his great love of God. In his little rules, which he lived by, which he encouraged to follow from the first years of seminary, there included an exhortation that at all times have a special love for your companions, and this mutual love must come from and tend toward God. Later in life, as is preserved in his journey of soul, the journey of a soul, from notes taken during a retreat in 1952, he writes, these are the footnotes, friendliness, serenity, and imperturbable patience. I must always remember that a soft answer turns away wrath. What bitterness is caused by abrupt, rough, or impatient manner? Sometimes the fear of being underestimated as a person of little worth tempts us to give ourselves airs and assert ourselves as little. But this is contrary to my nature, he writes. To be simple with no pretensions requires no effort from me. 
This is a great gift the Lord has bestowed on me. I want to preserve it and be worthy of it. He was thus from his earliest years as a seminarian formed to love his companions and friendliness was a quality that he cherished that was integral to the kind of person he wanted to be indeed a gift from God. Yes, Pope John, the good Pope, remains for us a model of true friendship and what friendship means. It's important to underscore that Christianity is not simply a list of commands and prohibitions, as important as they are to keep us on the straight and narrow. But Christianity, properly understood, is a joyful way of living, a way of living as friends. It is a way of living that is different than other ways of life. It's a way of life that gives us joy and hope as we look forward ultimately to eternal life with God. It gives us that present assurance that Jesus, the Son of the living God, in the power of the Holy Spirit, is walking with us individually as our companion and friend. Yes, even in the law library, Jesus, believe it or not, is walking with us, maybe even holding our books. In the upper room at Jerusalem, on the night before he died, Jesus spoke to his disciples about friendship, especially about friendship with him. He told his gathered apostles that night, you are my friends. I no longer call you slaves. I've called you friends because I've told you that everything I have heard from my father, John 15, 14, 5. And he sets forth a test of true friendship. No one has greater love than this than to lay down his life for his friends, John 15, 13. The Second Vatican Council, that great reforming council, teaches that by this revelation, the invisible God from the fullness of his love addresses men and women as friends and moves among them in order to invite and receive them into his company, his friendship. Jesus thus desires to be our friend. But what does that mean? What does friendship mean to us in this very busy and digital world that we live in? In this lecture entitled Friendship with Jesus and Each Other, I hope to give or pre present some approaches to answering this question. Some would say that friendship is a lost art or is merely reduced to a word used on Facebook. They would ask whether in fact it's possible to be friends with God that we do not see if we are increasingly unable or find it difficult to, find, to be friends with persons that we do see. On the other hand, and importantly, the way we think about human friendships can and should assist us in our efforts at a friendship relationship with God. As we recoup an understanding of true human friendships, it should be easier to approach friendship with God, our God, who calls us and names us friends. In his opening remarks to the young people in Poland this summer, on July 28, Pope Francis spoke of friendship. He said, to say that Jesus is alive means to rekindle our enthusiasm to following him, to renew our passionate desire to be his disciples. What better opportunity to renew our friendship, the Pope said, with Jesus than by building friendships among ourselves? What better way to build our friendship with Jesus than by sharing him with others?" Close quote. He said that before I wrote this talk, or after I wrote this talk. <laughs> as early as Aristotle, we learned from him three types of friendship. First, friendships of utility. We call them fair weather friends. We all know what that means. Second, friendships of pleasure. Emphasis on what I am getting from the relationship. And third, true friendships, truly a desire for the other's good. The latter, true friendships, is the clear preference. In my book, The Commandments We Keep, I mentioned that I'd asked members of my RCIA group, people thinking about becoming Catholics, 
a few years ago on the values and qualities that they would see in human friendship. They responded by highlighting the importance of loyalty among friends, openness, honesty, the exchanging of advice, and attempts at genuine mutual understanding. They also mentioned the sharing of activities and even hardships with each other and being proactive with each other, taking a risk for each other for friendship. Something we often don't do. We don't take risks in terms of our relations with each other. It's a good thing to do. Underlying these qualities, it would seem that a person-to-person -person relationship would be an essential quality to fostering and sustaining genuine human friendships. It takes a conscious effort, intentional effort, to sustain and develop friendships. In his wonderful book, The Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything, A Spirituality for Real Life, Jesuit Father James Martin devotes an entire chapter to friendship with God. He starts the chapter with a major point in the book of another Jesuit, Father William Barry, who actually concludes, the way you think about friendships can help you think about and deepen your relationship with God. If Jesus wishes to be our friend, and he has told us that he does, then at least by analogy, it would behoove us to reflect on the model human relationships we have had or continue to have. It might give us some insight into friendship with God and how that friendship, for sure a developing relationship with most of us, could be defined and experienced. My mom once told me, and now I believe correctly after all these years, if I had one genuine, faithful friend, consider myself a lucky person. Would you agree with that? One genuine, tested friend. We're very lucky. Proverbs teaches, some friends bring ruin on us, but a true friend is more loyal than a brother. Psalm 1820, Proverbs 18.24. It would seem then that true friends are hard to come by. I'm not speaking of acquaintances either. Those are the stuffed of Rolodexes, a distinctively Washington phenomenon. The genuine friendships are different. I cannot tell you how many spouses have referred to me, told me, referred to their respective spouse as my best friend. That's a good place to begin. St. Thomas Aquinas has written that through conjugal love, the love between a husband and wife, they participate in the greatest form of friendship. Pope Francis writes, speaking of married love, that it is a union possessing all the traits of a good friendship, concern for the good of the other, reciprocity, intimacy, warmth, stability, and the resemblance born of a shared life. Friendship does not necessarily disappear as couples grow older. As they know each other so well, every aspect seemingly of each other, they seem to be increasingly inseparable. It's the ultimate support. They enjoy simply being together. I've observed this from many, many couples and people that I've been fortunate to know. It's not just a quality of older couples either. I've observed that younger couples also enjoy spending time together to ensure that they that time happens, date nights are reserved on their iPhones. One younger couple recently told me they both very much enjoy simply sitting in front of the fireplace and relaxing with each other. A genuine friendship requires keeping in touch with each other. It requires, and this is often tested, being present in time of need or times of joy and truly caring for one another. It's expressed by unconditional love. After a period of time apart, it means picking up where one left off and not missing a beat. Friendship is another word for companionship, a one-on-one -on -one relationship between two people marked by mutual honesty and openness without fear of reprisals. Friendship requires the ability to listen to each other, even in one one might not be interested in a particular topic 
or issue, and that happens so often, doesn't it? <laughs> it's not overly competitive or based on primarily utilitarian interest. True friendship is an encounter with each other wherever one might be. Friendship is tested over time. One has a feel that a certain relationship is truly one of friendship and could and should be developed over time. One should not be afraid, moreover, to initiate and develop a friendship with another person. As I mentioned, sometimes it requires a personal risk. But above all, true friendships give joy and unique meaning to our lives. For those of you studying to become lawyers, and I'm in recovery, or already lawyers, you might know about Justice Scalia's friendship with Justice Ginsburg, whose views were polar opposite on legal matters from his. She referred to him as her best buddy, despite their differences in views. They both revered, despite their differences, the Constitution and the Supreme Court. Justice Scalia suggested that their friendship could easily be termed the odd couple. In her chambers, Justice Ginsburg has a picture of them riding on an elephant in India. Ginsburg, the pioneer of gender equality, has said that she was only sitting behind Scalia to distribute weight more evenly on the elephant. <laughs> it is this kind of banter between individuals with differing views that underscores the importance of not being disagreeable. And certainly, I think, for those of us who are lawyers or studying to be lawyers, this can be a wonderful thing to learn, that we can see the same, same provision of the law or the Constitution and differ. We differ as, uh, in, in, a, in a good way and then move on. I mean, that's part of the give and take, isn't it, in our profession, but certainly in life in general. Blessed um, Al Elred, he's a Cistercian abbot, of the 12th century, I had to do some digging here, wrote about a true, perfect, stable, and lasting friendship. He writes, it is a tie that envy cannot spoil, nor ambition destroy. Such a friendship, so tempted, yielded not an inch, was buffeted, but did not collapse. There is also, I would say, a healing power to genuine friendships with each other. I don't know if you saw the movie The King's Speech. It's one of my favorites, great movie. The King's therapist, who was a commoner, who became his friend, asked him, what are friends for? His response, I wouldn't know. The healing of his stammer was as much about the skills of the therapist as, as it was about the healing effect of perhaps his first that is the king, and only friendship, a commoner who helped him to speak without any impairment. In his encyclical letter, Deus Caritas, as God is love, Pope Emeritus Benedict writes, being a Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty ideal, but the encounter with an event, with a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. And that encounter is an encounter with Jesus. And that's the basis of our friendship with him. A follower, as a follower of Jesus, a personal relationship and encounter. Many of the qualities about which we just spoke in terms of human friendships apply at least by analogy to an encounter with our God and the embracing him as friend, the best of friends. We encounter God in two primary ways. For sure, we in prayer and in sacraments, for those of us who are, who are Catholics. We, for sure, we encounter him as well in each other, in the love that is his life within us. In the Transfiguration account, which is a great account from Scripture, we heard the words of God the Father spoke. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. This is an instruction, an invitation to prayer. Stated simply, prayer is the art of listening to Jesus, listening to the Word of God. It's an essential part of our friendship with Him, as in no small way the art of listening to another person 
And that person here is Jesus himself. It is communication with him, and it can be dialogic. In the opening homily of his pontificate, Pope Benedict spoke beautifully about friendship with Jesus. He said, if we let Christ into our lives, we lose nothing. Nothing, absolutely nothing, of what makes life free and beautiful and great. No, only in this friendship are the doors of life opened widely. Only in this friendship is the great potential of human existence truly revealed. Only in this friendship do we experience beauty and liberation. And so we often experience him in the silence of our hearts. For each of us, silence can also be a way of communication between and among friends and with God. Good friends need not talk all the time. Often is simply enough to be in the presence of a friend without even speaking. Presence is enough. About the encounter of prayer, that great Swiss theologian, Father Hans Urs von Balthasar, would you love to have that name? <laughs> once wrote, the vital thing is the living encounter with the God who speaks to us in his word, whose eyes pierce and purify us like a flame of fire, whose command summons us to new obedience, who each day instructs us as if until now we had learned nothing, whose power sends us out into the world upon our mission. My old rector at the North American College, Monsignor Charles Murphy, wrote a book belonging to God. And citing St. Teresa of Avila, he writes, prayer could be something else, something she called oratio mental, which in her words, nothing else than a close sharing between friends. It means taking the time frequently to be alone with him who we know loves us. And it means praying that he might touch our hearts, that we might seek his friendship all the more. In a word, it's the experience of meeting God, a lived and living relationship with God. It's not simply talking with God. He knows our every thought. It is listening to God, listening for God, that requires silence, a nearly forget forgotten dimension in our contemporary American life. Sometimes we await the answer, our desired answer. Sometimes we never receive it. Other times we receive it in a different way and, and come to see his wisdom and not our own. Patience is a quality of every relationship and friendship and not always on our own terms. Friendship with God is also walking with him, being in God's presence, shutting everything else out. It's wasting time with God, not unlike wasting time and just being with someone you love, just hanging out. Prayer is kissing God, touching him, a touching of spirits, a conscious awareness of his presence, an intimacy with him, a friendship, a daily appointment. St. Jose Maria Escriva once wrote, the first appointment every day should be with Jesus Christ. That appointment is a prayerful encounter of friendship. In addition to prayer as Catholics, we uniquely encounter Jesus in the sacraments, another way of deepening and experiencing our friendship with God. And sacraments define us as Catholics. They are moreover transforming encounters. They are encounters with a true friend. And Jesus calls us his friends. We come to see Jesus as a healing friend in the sacraments of reconciliation and the anointing of the sick, and one who nourishes us in the Eucharist, one who binds us to himself in baptism and sends his spirit to us in confirmation that we might know to come to know him in spirit and in truth as one who makes it possible for others to stand in for him in persona Christi for priests and model his love for us. His church as two spouses do in holy matrimony. As I wrote in my book on the sacraments we celebrate, each sacramental encounter brings us in touch with the living and risen, risen Lord, an encounter that changes and transforms us, that gives us grace. Could there be any better one-on-one -on -one friendship relationship with this? Dear friends, our age 
is marked and effectively transformed by another kind of friendship, that of social networking. We have not yet been able to text God or have his face on our Facebook, although it might happen. But as helpful as this new technology is in bringing people together, I sometimes think that notwithstanding the ease of communicating with one another, we seem to be getting more distant from one another. I'm not a Luddite. I'm learning about Twitter and Facebooks and Blackberries and Blueberries and in fact have written six books with the assistance of a computer, believe it or not. But if truth be told, I commute daily and hopefully effectively on the computer. Sometimes I worry, as I am sure you do, that it can become addictive and absorbing. For sure, for each of us, there needs to be a word of caution. Social networking can replace, cannot replace the one-on-one -on -one relationship that is the traditional mark of a unique friendship with each other and with God. In his 45th World Communications Day message, Pope Benedict speaking on the extraordinary potential of the internet and other means of social technology set forth some risks. He wrote, in the search for sharing for friends, there is the challenge to be authentic and faithful and not give in to the illusion of constructing an artificial public profile for oneself. He adds, it's important always to remember that virtual contact cannot and must not take the place of direct human contact, which people at every level of our lives so need. It's so easy to hide behind the email, isn't it? Instead of listening to someone person to person or increasingly depersonalize our relationship through the use of such technology. We've seemingly come a long way from having our dog as our best friend. It's now so often the Blackberry or whatever new means of social communication being sold. Unlike the dog, it does not have to be walked. These are just caveats. True friendship is not simply a technological connection. It is an encounter with each other and above all with God. The deeper our continual encounter with God, the more fruitful will be our friendship encounters with each other. There's no replacement or improvement for that kind of friendship with God and each other. It's in our human interest to develop an attempt to learn what the concept of friendship uniquely means for us, it's worth all the effort in appropriating a genuine relationship with God and each other. I conclude with the words of Pope Francis who writes, I invite all Christians everywhere at this very moment to be a, to a renewed personal encounter with Jesus, or at least an openness to letting him encounter them. I ask all of you to do this unfailingly each day no one should think that this invitation is not meant for him or her, since no one is excluded from the joy brought by the Lord. I speak of true friendship. And finally, I wish to evoke the memory of Pope St. John XXIII and ask him to intercede for this great law school and this great Catholic university, and for each one of us, without exception, as we continue our efforts to grow in friendship with one another and our God. Thanks so much for listening to me today and hopefully there was something here of value. So God bless you. We have a token of our appreciation for you, and we have a bit of self-interest. It has our logo on it. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> and and we, we would like you to take the pen out whenever you're in the presence of a prospective law student. <laughs> <laughs> you say prospective donor. <laughs> or donor. Or donor. Either, Either one. Either way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I, would you be willing sure. to? Sure. Um, we discussed whether or not... Uh, Monsignor would be willing to take a question, and in light of this current occupation, we'll give preference to anyone wearing a collar today. <laughs> oh! Father, do you have a question? Uh, 
Uh, Monsignor and I have known each other for a very, very, very long time. <laughs> and you've been chaplain of the John Carroll Society for 30 years. And throughout that period, for those who do not know, that is a very, very professional organization here in Washington, D.C., lawyers, doctors. What would you give as advice to the people who will eventually enter into the society and certainly become professionals, having been a chaplain for 30 years to people who are in that professional life already? I would say that um, to develop friendships with each other. I mean, it's it's an oasis with a group of people. There are, we have over a thousand, more than a thousand members. But I was in an event last night, which we sponsored, and I looked around and I thought to myself, it was not a great crowd because of the rain, but I looked around and I thought to myself, some of these people have been here for a long time and they're really friendly with each other. And there were some young new people coming in. One person just graduated from law school well, they opened up their arms to her, and we asked her to join us, and she said, I can't wait to join, and I look forward to being able to be together. I think in a, Washington can be very impersonal. It can be very, very challenging, huh? And I think it's important to stick together, not in an inclusive way, but to stick together to help each other, to walk with each other, to relearn friendship, maybe learn it for the first time. And groups like the John Carroll's, I provide that option. And I want to thank Mother O'Brien, who's been so supportive. And when we started the Red Mass up again, you never miss, and except when you're off somewhere. But you were always there, and you brought students from Catholic University, and that was a very, very supportive and a wonderful thing to do. So I want to thank you publicly for that. Yes? You. My, my parishioner. I'm pretty sure he has reference. Okay. Uh, how, what advice would you give to law students who are trying to balance their, you know, heavy school load, <clears throat> high professors, um, with uh, like their friendship with Jesus and uh, you know their their faith? Because it can be really hard sometimes. That's a question you could ask of a parish priest, you could ask of the president, you could ask of a dean, you could ask of any of us. We're all very, very taxed, right? And somehow, what I have learned when I get up in the morning, I do my prayer early in the morning. And when I don't, and sometimes I don't, uh, I know my day is different. It doesn't, prayer is kind of like the bookends of the day. You know, just to, to greet the Lord, be in the Lord's presence in the morning, and, and just to maybe read a little scripture text. And then at night, just kind of review the day, when were you close to the Lord, when were you not. And if you, if you do that, somehow during the day, just that acknowledgement, that intentional acknowledgement of the presence of God living within you, makes the difference. You're able to make choices a lot easier. You know, um, we all are called to make choices all day long. You know, what, what, what email do we respond to now? What person do we see now? You know, what do we write now? And all, it's a day full of, most of them are good choices. Uh, but if we have some sense intentionally from the beginning of the day, the Lord's walking with us. Uh, we have a buddy, we have a friend, you know, with us. So it's just, I think, getting to the discipline of doing that before we begin our day, it doesn't take a lot of time. 10, 15, 20 minutes, I mean, you know, uh, it doesn't take a lot of time, but it can have incredible effects during the day. I don't know if that helps at all. No, it's a really good answer. Thank you. Great. Yes. Hi. Um, first of all, I wanted to say it's good to see you again. I was a member of the Little Flowers Church, but that the dean did not mention that with Justice Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank God you <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Um, I, I worry a little bit about the, um, the level of vitriol in the public discourse today. Uh, and it seems like we're in a, a culture of shaming and a lot of mean-spirited discussion. And you know, you can imagine sort of what I'm referencing just in terms of the sure. political world that we're living in. And I just wonder if, um, you know, what you were saying about friendship, connecting with others, being authentic and vulnerable with each other, um, given this climate, if you feel that that is more difficult for us to do with one another and ultimately with God in this, what I feel is sort of this very um, painful context or, or sort of mean-spirited. Um, well, hopefully this pain will pass. It's not part of our American experience. Yeah. So we can't, we have to continue on being uh, the way we were formed to be, uh, even though it can be somewhat countercultural. I was mentioning to the dean when I was a student at Gonzaga in the 60s, uh, I would often walk up to the Capitol 
And in those days, there were no guards, there was nobody, right? And I'd go walk in and I'd listen to the debate because I used to take the train home. So I would listen for an hour or so to senators on both sides of the aisle. It was during the time the Civil Rights Bill was being debated. And I was just sitting there watching these senators debate and debate very, very strongly. And then when the debate was over, they put their arm around each other, they left, probably went up and had a little nightcap or something together, but they were friends. They, they, they treated each other with respect, even though they debated very hard on, on the floor, they knew each other, they remained in Washington on weekends, they socialized with others, it was bipartisan, it wasn't just groups that were together who fought the same way, but it was, a, it, was a, it was a beautiful way. And I think it goes to show that in our body politic, that type of, uh, of uh, dealing with each other is still very much possible. And we can't allow the vitriol that you're talking about to define us as Americans because it's not part of our experience. It's not part of the, the best part of our experience. Yeah. Uh, most interpersonal friendships are between peers and they're people on an equal footing. And in, the, in your example of a young couple, a, a, a man and wife who are on equal footing, since there's an inherent inequality between God and, and man, given that it's the creator and his creation, uh, what do you think are the challenges in fostering that friendship, given that inequality, and how would you but what is your advice for you know, continuing to foster it in spite of those challenges? I try to use the word inequality because uh, we, are, we live in God. God lives within us. It's a different kind of a relationship. Um, for sure, he is God. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. We're not denying that. But he also uh, uh, he, he had a son who took on a human condition uh, as we have, and he ennobled the human condition by his words and his deeds. He came to know the human condition it, from the inside out. Uh, he came in effect to save us and he showed his love for us unconditionally by what he did and his healings and his words. So when we get to know uh, Jesus better, we get to know the God who, who is our savior, but fundamentally he's our friend because he called us friends. And I, would, I don't think on the, we know he's all powerful for sure. We, we breathe and we live only because of his power within us but he's also breathing a new life within us, which is his life. And that brings us closer to him in, in, in so many ways. So to keep focused on Jesus is what I would, 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 uh, would suggest. And learning about him and praying about him, learning about him in the gospel, you know, how he made choices. And what choices did he make? Just read the, the, the gospels, you, you see that daily. That might help a little bit. I mean, the, his relationship with his disciples. I mean, they traveled as a group for three years. They didn't, they didn't stay at any motels, I don't think. We never heard about motels in the Holy Land. I mean, where did they stay? I don't know, but they, 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 they obviously were, were close friends. They went two by two when, they, when he sent them out. So he modeled something that was inherently different and uh, very, very powerful. So maybe kind of catching that spirit is I think what would help us in our friendship with God. Yeah, sure. Okay, thanks for coming to uh, speak with us today. Can you talk a little bit about the distinction between friendship and friendliness? Because it seems like to truly cultivate a friendship either with another person or with God, you have to invest a great deal of time in that. But then also there seems to be a certain virtue in, in just that friendliness or maybe in the society, <clears throat> uh, the John Carroll Society, like are people friends in the sense that they spend a great deal of time together and they're more just friendly when they see each other? Friendliness is probably a precondition to friendship. You know, it's an attitude in approaching someone in a relationship. It doesn't always end up in what we call a legitimate friendship, but it's certainly a way of approaching someone else. Uh, it might end up in something deeper and, and, and it may end up uh, in marriage. It may end up in just having really good friend that you could call upon, or that person he or she could call upon upon us at different times. So it's an attitude how we approach the encounter with someone else. I think that's how I would, and that's, we, there has to be an assumption, not the type of relationship. You were talking about the, the, the virile type, but, the, uh, the, the, but, but a friendly atmosphere, a friendly approach to someone. It's not phony either. I mean, it can be, but you can, you can tell if it's phony or not. Not really true. 
Does that help at all? But then that's not that's not friendship. Would not be. But but a friendly attitude could develop into friendship. You know, it doesn't just happen overnight. As you say, it takes effort. And sometimes we fail at it. Sometimes we're scorned. So all that's part of the, the puzzle, but it's worth it. It's worth the effort. Anything else? One more. Yes. Uh, would you it talk wouldn't be a lecture without <laughs> Professor Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> I love to ask questions. Would you talk a little bit about your um, legal training and how um, uh, it impacts on your life now that you're no longer practicing law? Um, I have absolutely no uh, unhappiness that I went through law school at Virginia, <laughs> that I, uh, I clerked in the D.C. Court of Appeals, I went to a major law firm, um, at Father O'Brien, Father Antonicelli, both as Monsignor Antonicelli, both. We both had the same experience going through. Um, in my life, I think what, what the legal training has helped most is in counseling and in preaching People bring complex situations to us and the ability to break them down into bite-sized pieces and, to, and not to be afraid to do that. Or hopefully in our preaching, you know, to be able to um, deal with a soundbite generation in a way that, uh, that has credibility <coughs> and truth, um, but is, is anchored and also uh, organized and disciplined. But, but I think mainly in the, in the pastoral work, at least in my 31 years as a priest in the, in the pastoral work, it's taking complex situations. I mean, people come with you, and we all have, we go with each other with complex situations. And when you really listen and you're able to break them down, you know, all of a sudden you can sense in people that their fear and their anxiety is reduced. And so we're now down to something, well, look, let's try this or try this or try this and gradually problem gets resolved or gets reduced in, in whatever. But I think the training, I don't know about uh, Monsignor and Father, I don't know if you feel the same way, but I think our training of law, in law, very much helps us do that. So I'm, I'm very, very grateful that I had that experience as a lawyer. And as it turns out now, I deal with lawyers most of the most of my, <laughs> my day anyway. So at least you, you know the language and the, and the lingo that, uh, that lawyers have. But it's a great form of training for anything, really. So interesting because frequently those two things are juxtaposed, counseling and analytical and organizational ability, then you're seeing that one assists you with Oh, I think that they're very, I think they very much assist. I mean, I think, I mean, we all know it. We all get thrown complicated, particularly in situations outside of our little comfort zone. You know, we get thrown things and, you know, you're able to take a breath and begin to break it down and then, then move. I mean, that's how we deal with a legal problem. And a personal problem is a, is a legal problem that hasn't gone, uh, gone, gone to court. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, please join me in thanking Monsignor Vaga. Join us in the atrium for an informal reception. Have a chance to say hello to Monsignor Vaghi in person and ask him about his next book. Oh, I haven't had. I should. I should. That was fabulous.